The question is, what's in a flag? The president, Ms. Budrani, pointed made some observations about the flag having meaning. It is the primary symbol of a nation, a symbol of nationhood. It is the one thing that galvanizes a people when we think of our country and when we think of how we project ourselves to the world. And so we assume that there is a lot of meaning associated with this symbol. And so we begin then, in this story, on November 2nd, 1819. And here you have a meeting of the magistrates of the settlement. This is just for putting things into perspective. This is 21 years after the Battle of St. George's Key, as a historical reference. Uh, the settlement is still very much vulnerable. Uh, when you look at the historical records, you will see that there is a lot of uh, uh, back and forth and mixed feelings about who should have what sort of power within the settlement, especially between the magistrates and the superintendent who is sent from Jamaica to try and, uh, and the superintendents who are sent from Jamaica to try and uh, instill some sort of order among the magistrates and the settlers who were considered sort of uh, on the periphery of the, of the global empire of Britain. It's important to note that in this particular historical context, the Belize, the settlement, is not even a colony. It is a, it is sort of a protectorate. And one of the things that the settlers find themselves doing is trying to assert their autonomy and sovereignty. And one of the ways to do that is to develop symbols for the settlement. And so you have here at the, at the bottom, you see Marshall Bennett makes a motion and the meeting is being presided by Mr. Min, who's one of the, these are all wealthy men by the way. These are the wealthiest settlers in, in, the, in Belize. You're looking at a population of maybe uh, three, close to 4,000 uh, persons. And so Marshall Bent makes the motion, whereas it is necessary in all well-regulated governments that a seal of arms should be had for the purpose of giving authority and credence to public acts and documents. And whereas this settlement stands in great need of the same. So that motion is put and it is seconded by, seconded by Thomas Paslow. And here you have the request for a seal of arms. Fast forward a couple of years, we move to the next slide, and we are at March 15th, 1821. And the minutes records here that the seal has been received, has been lodged and received, and it is lodged by the keeper of the records, who at this time is uh, George Westley. And so this is November 2nd, 18, sorry, 18, sorry, 1819, I'm sorry. And what you have here, this is a reproduction that was done by the Lee's Archives and Record Service. And uh, they, actually, this is the, the minutes here. And so at the archives, you will see an empty circle, like, like this one here. So for, for educational purposes, what they did was to take the seal and insert it into the space that was designated. And so this is the first seal. I can remember seeing this for the first time uh, in, in 1998. It was the bicentennial celebration of the Battle of St. George's Key. At the time, I was only in my second year as a, as a teacher. And I saw this in the commemorative booklet that was produced for that occasion. And so I you know, had the responsibility of going to class and so on, teaching about this. And so what struck me, the question that came to my mind was how in a colonial slave society do you end up with two black men on the coat of arms? 
So that is a very curious thing to find a society that is dominated by a handful of white, white uh, forest, uh, we call them foristocracy. These are white um, woodcutters who own gangs of slave, enslaved persons, gangs of Africans who go into, who uh, demarcate parcels of land along the river banks and cut wood. So how do you end up with that? And so this is the question we'll answer. What you see here on the left is a recent reproduction of the armorial ensigns of the 4th West India Regiment. And if you look to the right, you will see the seal of the settlement. You see the resemblance that is starting to emerge. What happens is that during the Battle of St. George's scheme, in, the, in preparation for the defense of the settlement, the settlers had requested help from Jamaica, and there was some delay in that happening, but eventually the 6th West India Regiment arrived in the settlement. Now what people miss most times when we talk about the Battle of St. George's scheme is that we know that you have the white slave owners, you have the enslaved population, and then you have the soldiers who came, who were stationed out where Hallover Bridge is today. That is where they would have taken up their defensive position during the Battle of St. George's scheme. So one of the things that people miss is that the 6th West Indian Regiment was a black army. It was an army made up of African, previously enslaved Africans, who had been taken off ships that were being brought and to be traded, and they were enlisted in an army. Now why would you do that? Well, why did the British do that? The British did that because the white soldiers did not do too well in the Caribbean tropical climates. They succumbed to disease more easily, and as a result, they enlisted African uh, in African slaves into their armies. And so, we have been searching for, however, the armorial ensigns of the 6th West India Regiment. We have not found that just as recently as this afternoon. I've been having continuous conversations with, for example, the military museum in, in Jamaica, which houses, has a, a museum dealing with the West India Regiments. The only one that they have as well is this 4th West India Regiment. So what we're proposing is that one of the dominant images within the settlement will have been the armorial ensigns of the West India Regiment. And that influences the preparation of the coat of arms. Fast forward now, we ask the question, well, who is responsible for this? Who will, who has this idea of putting two black men on the seal of the settlement? I'm going to narrow it down to three people. Thomas Fixstock, the third, Thomas Passon, and Marshall Bennett. Now, what is curious about these three individuals is that they are white individuals, that, that's obvious at the time, because they, but they are very powerful. Passon and Bennett had the opportunity to participate in the defense of the settlement during the Battle of St. George's scheme. Both are large slave owners, they own lots of slaves. Thomas Fixstock is new to the settlement. But there's another interesting thing, is that Paso, Bennett, and Pixar are also officers in the local militia. So in addition to the Western regiments that are here in the settlement at the time, Pixar, Paso, Bennett are officers in the local militia, which also enlist slaves, enslaved persons, free colored persons, and the officers are white. That, was the same, that is the same, uh, that mimics what was present in terms of the West Indian Regiment. But 
We have here, just for in recent time, there's been much discussion about Thomas Passler. I just want to say a few things about that. Thomas Passler, during the Battle of St. George's Sea, and when you go through the records, you begin to understand why the settlers and as the East progressed, for example, they gave the building the name Passler. I'll give you, he's buried in the middle of the Arbor Cemetery. If you go in it, if you go there, He's buried in the smack dab in the middle next to his wife, Larissa, who was a free colored woman. Thomas Paslow, during, in preparation for the battle, and when the question was put forward whether or not to stay and defend the settlement or to evacuate, Thomas Paslow said to, to his colleagues, a man who is not willing to die for his country, should not be able to reap the benefits thereof. It's, it's documented. So he's sort of a, a brave guy, you know. Um, he wants to stay and defend the settlement. The same Thomas Paslo, when the vote is taken and the flowers but 14 carry the vote to stay and defend the settlement, the same Thomas Paslo encounters a few folks who still want to leave. They're still bickering to leave. He tells them, look, if you want to leave, you have a week. Let's give them a week to get out of here. And if you don't leave in a week, we will treat you as enemies of the settlement as well. Okay. Now I'm just telling you the history now. So what you have is your lightning rod. This guy is the lightning rod, no? The great defender, but brutal to in his to his slaves. That's just the history. Marshal Bennett, the largest, he's the, he's the head honcho in a sense, the most senior magistrate. And uh, Thomas picks up, he's a captain, and it gives you a breakdown. He's a captain in the, uh, in the local militia, it gives you a breakdown of what the militia looked like. You would have an artillery unit, infantry, ensigns, and quartermasters. But why we're focusing on Thomas Big Stock here, no, we zoom in on Big Stock. It's because you see, we have here, okay. Let's go back again. Okay. We have here the coat of arms of Thomas Fixer. Notice the resemblance to the seal. The similar features. You see the, the mahogany tree, you see the ship, you see the motto. Underneath here, some umbra, some umbra floreo. Underneath here, you have to really zoom, look at it with a mic, with a, what do you call that thing? A lens. And when you believe it or not, Google it, it's an address that's under there, dating back to that period. And when you Google it, it takes you to his place of origin in Jersey, in the, in the, in the United Kingdom, his place of origin. But the thing here now is, this is... This is as close as we get in terms of suspecting who would have prepared the coat of arms itself. So who prepared it? We're suspecting Thomas Fixup had something to do with that. Now, why would these three men, why would these three men do something like that? And here's what we're looking at. Before we get there, let's look at, I have two images here. This is what a soldier in the West Indian Regiment would have looked like. This is a, a mannequin in Brimstone Hill in St. Kitts and Nevis. This is one of the earliest photos of woodcutters here in the, in the Belize settlement. This dates back to the 1880s. I here took a number of uh, photographs during that, that period. Here you have a, a little reference, the, there's been ongoing work at the at St. George's Key. 
Um, John Searle and his family have been assisting some of the archaeologists who have been working at St. George's Key to see who has been buried there. And according to the work that, that they have here, you will see that they have found the presence of the 2nd, 5th, and 7th. Our research in the archives also reveals the presence of the, of the 6th so far. But it's an ongoing work. So we have these range of regiments we know have been, have, have been present in Belize up to 18, 17 at least. So how do you end up with a scene with two black men? This is what we are proposing. That one of the situations they were encountering was that you had an increased number of runaways to Guatemala in particular in terms of the enslaved population. As a matter of fact, the public meeting reports on this and cites the, that this is a concern. By this time, the abolition movement to bring about the end of slavery is in full swing in, in England and in the Caribbean. You have a number of revolts in Jamaica, Haiti, Barbados. As a matter of fact, in the settlement itself, in 1820, there is a revolt uh, here in the settlement. There's an overwhelming population disparity. By 1816, when we look at the 1816 census records, 2,742 of 3,824 3, persons are enslaved persons. There's a tenuous legal status. The settlers, again, are constantly, as I mentioned earlier, constantly wanting to retain their autonomy, but at the same time wanting the support of Jamaica but not wanting the interference of the superintendents. As a matter of fact, it is a settlement still in the making. But, as you note in, the, in their presentation of 18, of, 18, in, of 1819, where they request the, um, the seal, you see that they're saying that it is so that it gives credence to their acts, of, to their, their legal acts and, and documents and so on. And, Finally, one of the things we learned is that in 1817, the 5th West India Regiment, which had been disbanded, they were sent to Belize. So, the dominant imagery then, the dominant imagery would have been the armorial ensigns of the, these black armies. Secondly, Paslo, Bennett, and Pixar are military men themselves. So, they can see how they can position themselves, retain their power within the settlement and the power of the ruling, the ruling forcocracy by creating a seal that features two black men. And it mimics, it mimics visually the seal, the armorial, armorial ensigns of the West Indian Regiment. But instead of putting soldiers on the seal, you end up with two men with their tools of their trade. You end up with the tools of their trade. You end up with the Union Jack. You end up with the mahogany tree and the Sabombra flore under the shade we flourish. It is a move to appease what is a population. Now listen to this. If, if you have 3,800 people, and then you have 500 West India Regiment soldiers who are being disbanded and sent to the settlement. If you have the 6th West India Regiment who are present in Belize being a black army, and do you know where they recruited the 6th West India Regiment soldiers from? They were recruited from the Mosquito Shore. Why is that significant? Because half the population already in the settlement are from the Mosquito Shore. It is likely that half of every real person here, or every real person here, this for argument's sake, will have mosquito blood in you. That is very likely. Right? And so your, your ancestors would be some of these people, including the enslaved, enslaved Africans who were here. Keep in mind, we're looking at this particular period in history. The country will continue to evolve. Now what reinforces this idea? What says, okay, we're still doubtful about the whole thing. We find, with the help of the Belize Archives and Red Service, we find 
this seal, an official seal, and you can see the features. Two soldiers, mahogany tree, tools, ship. We can't make out exactly what is our affair, but we see Omnia something, but Omnia, the close in Latin, the, trans the closest translation is united or together, whatever the phrase would have been. But what this tells us that this is the seal of an officer of the West India Regiment. And what does that resemble? Resembles this. So just these small bits of history, the investigative history tells us what the dominant imagery of the settlement would be and how that translates into the creation of the sea. Here is one of the earliest, this is a copy of one of the early fabrics. It was first, I first saw it in the Raja Bokli document on the West India Regiment. Okay, it must be right here. So here's an interesting statement for you. While subsequently this battle was taken by the settlers as the basis of the claim that Belize was sovereign by a right of conquest, as well as settlement, this is Humphrey's writing in his diplomatic history, at the time, the British were still reluctant to claim sovereignty. They said that thus little attention was paid to these stirring events until 1824, referring to the battle, when the accounts on which they were based were published in Jamaica and presented to members of the British Parliament as part of the defense of the settlers against the unjust and unfounded representations of Colonel George Arthur, late superintendent of the settlement. What they were complaining about here was their behavior, towards his authority and, his, and their treatment of the enslaved population. Their tributes to the bravery and loyalty of the slaves buttress this defense against charges of cruelty to the slaves. So, in terms of imagery, you can see the psychology of an image. You put two black men on the seal, and it becomes a form of appeasement so that you're able to retain your position of power. Now, and it is important to say this. This is not to say that all the, the black populations were not resistant and actors in the process of, develop, of developing the place themselves, even in an enslaved position. Because one of the things that history does, history usually presents in the general narratives, it says that the enslaved persons were, were helpless, they were subjected to, to the treatment of the masses and so on, and does not give them any position of where they are able to resist. And that is not the case in history. History is a little bit more complex than that. So they too are actors themselves in the development of beliefs. You see the imagery now in terms of its use first appears on the Honduras Gazette and Commercial Advertiser July, 30, July 1st, 1826. This is uh, owned by Thomas Pickstock for about a year or so. And then it is sold to the Legislative Assembly where they begin to publish uh, the legal affairs of the, of the settlement inside this, what becomes the Honduras Almana. So here is the cover of that book. This is an almost annual report that's produced, almanac that's produced about the affairs of the settlement, and you see it being used now in official, in an official capacity, the seal of the settlement. 1871, you see the seal still being used here in the new era, the British Honduras Chronicle, and the British Honduras Chronicle. Now what's significant about 1871 is that at this time we become a crown colony. If you recall, by 1859, the boundary treaty is signed between Britain and Spain, and it demarcates the boundaries of, the, the boundaries are established of, of modern Belize, and shortly after we become a colony, and then we become a crown colony. 
So what, what's the difference between the early period where the seal was established and 1871? It means, when, once you become a crown colony, it means that Britain has more direct control over the settlement. So the settlers in have less authority and say over their own affairs. So we have here the flag of the settlement, which is used from 1871 through to uh, independence, and uh, which is the same different from the Union Jack, by the way, Union Jack would just be up here. And you see the centerpiece of the original seal being reintroduced and the men are, are gone. What comes into use then? The seal is no longer used. And what comes into use is the seal of the crown. The seal of the of England. And so all official documents are printed in the government gazette using this particular seal. Contrasted with back in 1826 when this was the seal that was used. 1898 is the centennial of the Battle of St. George's Steel. And we see new images starting to emerge. You see here You see here the play on the centerpiece of the seal, and notice what happens. You go from two men of color to a white man and a black man. What is happening simply is that there is a jostling for rights and right of place within the Middle Settlement. And so there is a conversation, if you want to call it that, about the role of blacks and whites in the settlement and the Creole elites would have been the lighter skinned population. And in case you have a range of persons in the settlement at the time, headed by officials from, the, from England. And so you have this dynamic emerging in the period 1889 to 1898. 1888, by the way, sorry, 1888 to 1898. 1888, by the way, is the jubilee anniversary of emancipation. And so in the settlement at the time, persons like Simon Lamb would have being well spearheaded the efforts to commemorate the end of slavery. But that does not continue. What, com what emerges is the celebration of the Battle of St. George's Key. Here again you see the play on the imagery. Shoulder to shoulder. You're using it for advertisement purposes now, fine old scotch whiskey. Appears in the clarion. One of the reasons for that we learn is that this postage stamp was, that we just saw here, was sent to the Crown for approval by the colonial authorities, but it was never approved. So it tells you even more so about the narrative that the society, that the elites are putting, are pushing in terms of black, the relationships between the blacks and the whites and the people and the, all the shades in between. Here's a, go back here. So in 1907, now as we enter the 20th century, the arms of the settlement re-emerges. So maybe 80, 80 years later, we see an official royal warrant is issued from England, from the College of Arms, which provides a seal of arms or armorial bearings for the settlement. 
and it is a return to what was first presented in 1821. And this more closely resembles now the what we will emerge as the flag of Belize. So just for for quick look at it quickly in terms of the description that's here. So the chevron refers to this inverted this inverted V. The sinister side is the right side from your perspective. You have the, the paddle, the hard on the tree, the axe. The dexter side is the left side from your perspective that's here. The breeches, which is the the pants that the men are wearing, trousers colored with a shade of silver, and then you see the, the tool. But these are the general features, the shield in itself, and of course the, the same motto, under the shield we flourish. This is global advertising here at its best. This is a tobacco producer, and he uses the seal of the settlement to promote the to market cigarettes, no? Now this image, I can't date it, but found it on Facebook. Belize abroad, wherever you are. But what is significant about this here is it talks about self-identification. The right of a person to identify with the, to have a right of belonging. And you have two men here participating and creating a living image of the seal of the settlement. Self-identification. Acknowledging the role of the ancestors in the forestry industry which dominated the settlement all the way up to the 1960s when agriculture finally replaces forestry this is one of the historical truths about these we enter now the period we know we call the nationalist movement and in 1950 february 2nd the belize billboard is the mouthpiece of the nationalist movement just one month earlier on December 31st the People's Committee was formed and it included George Price, Philip Bolson, Lee Richardson, John Smith and who am I missing? Nicholas Pollard and they present here the, look what the headline says Bayman flag raised above battlefield. We have recovered the ancient flag of the Bayman, John Smith. So it reads now, exactly at 9.35 oh, o'clock last night, Wednesday, February 1st, 1915, while the band blared lustily and thousands of Hondurans sang God bless America with emotional gusto, the flag of the Bayman which up to 70 years had no fruit flew over these shores 70 years ago, was raised aloft on the battlefield, just outside. Seconds later, the stars and stripes went up on the other side. Both flags waved in the breeze. Look at the political dynamics that's emerging now. God bless America, stars and stripes. We go down here now. As the meeting drew to a close, the People's Committee Secretary George Price spread the Bayman flag as it waved in the wind and told the assembly, Behold, the ancient flag of this country, blue as the skies above, high ideals of democracy, the cast of arms, the symbol of our country. Take it, protect it, love it, and perhaps someday, if this is your wish, we shall move it from here and put it over there. This is in battlefield, you know. We'll move it from here and put it over there. What do you think he was talking about? They found Paul right behind the, it would have, yeah, right behind the, the Supreme Court. The Bayman flag is a light blue. In the center, it carries the coat of arms of the settlement and a white circle. The 
symbol reemerges. So according to this, this would have, because we have looked in the records to see if we could find anywhere where we have a, an accounting of, the, of this flag being thrown up to 1870. 1871, remember that's the year when we become a colony, when Belize becomes a colony, but it's the, we don't find anything. So we're relying on, and these individuals are relying on the oral history of their parents and grandparents. Just as we rely on the oral history of our parents and grandparents. So this is what we have to go with it. They, I had the opportunity to meet a gentleman named Nick Sullivan, introduced to me by Captain Nicolas Sanchez. He was 90-something years old, a surveyor of the BEC for about 60 years, very knowledgeable man, and he described it actually slightly different from this. And what he says was that that flag was originally white with a blue circle in the middle. And it was a pilotage flag. Um, but when we looked in the records for, that, for the 1820s, all we could find was a, the, only thing that the only thing that resembled that was a male flag. A flag that was raised to indicate that male had arrived in the settlement. We fast forward, and here is a beautiful remark again, same billboard. It is your flag. As we celebrate our day, let blue and white be our colors. The, people commit, the People's Committee will be getting more flag, more large flags made. But everyone in the vast meeting can make a Bayman flag. Just get a piece of sky blue cloth and sew it and sew on it a white circle. The coat of arms is not essential. That's George Price speaking. Ten thousand chair decision to celebrate our way. One of the things that emerges during this period now, emergence of the, this idea, and this was one of the, the difficulties that was associated with the imagery of the flag, and the flag being associated with the celebration, what is the day they're talking about, the 10th of September parade. And the leaders of the People's Committee begin to, People's United Party begin to have differing views about the 10th of September celebration. One says that it is the, should be the 10th, the other says it should be a national day. But there are two different sets of philosophies involved here. And that will eventually lead to a split in the People's United, sorry, the People's United Party in 1957 and you will have the formation of what will emerge as a two-party system. But something is happening simultaneously here in terms of the emergence of national symbols. Here we have, for the first time, the People's Committee Prayer. We all have what you call the national um, prayer, no? It is not, that is not officially in our laws, but it is accepted by, by precedence and practice. So here is one version of it. Here's an image of who the early leaders of, the, of that movement are who are using the Bayman's flag. So the battle of the flags, let's look at what this says. Today the people of Belize are engaged in a contest to celebrate their national day with a flag symbolic of their Bayman ancestors and of their country. And such a contest should be raging in one of the... One of the disgraces of... The, the fact that such a contest should be raging is one of the disgraces of colonialism. A stranger in our, in our midst would find it hard to believe that in the past the people of the land celebrated their national day with a flag other than their own. Every country boasting a national day celebrates a day with the country's flag as the dominant flag of the festivities. For years the people of British Honduras celebrated national day 
with the United Flag of Scotland and Wales. What they're telling you now in the anti-colonial movement is that that is no longer our, that is no longer a flag that should not be our flag. What is our flag is the ancient flag of the Bayman. Here they still honor Samuel Lam for his initial efforts. Samuel Lam is associated with the 10th of September, but one of the things that he doesn't get acknowledgement for would be his early efforts in terms of the emancipation. But that history is still to be, to be told. Talk about symbols, land of the gods. What is sung as a national anthem all the way up to just the prior independence, what we now see as land of the free was originally land of the gods. And all of this is emerging, written by Samuel Haynes, with music by Samuel Young. Keep that in mind. Because when the split happens in 57, we have the formation of the National Independence Party, and their and they mouthpiece is the what? The Belize Billboard. The Belize Billboard, remember, was the mouthpiece of the People's United Party at first. But when the split happens, the Belize Times becomes the mouthpiece of the People's United Party, and the Billboard becomes the mouthpiece of the National Independence Party. And so, Right around 1961, it was already known that the countries of the British Caribbean countries would be getting their independence. Jamaica, uh, Barbados, Trinidad, and so on. Belize was also to get its independence. And so, when the National Independence Party for, forms, it is with the idea that we are establishing a democracy, an opposition, and with free, free and fair elections, you would have uh, they would have representation in the emerging assembly. And so they, there's a controversy too that develops again over the flag. No celebrations in NIP if the blue and white flags are used. But the re what is going on here you must understand the backdrop. There is a general distrust and delight, dislike among the two parties because, and let me give you the crux of it, there was one disbelief that the PUP were moving towards a closer association, building a settlement and beliefs towards a closer association with Central America and Guatemala. And that was juxtaposed with the NIP who were in favor of closer association with the Caribbean. And that is just the, at the surface. What is indicative here is that there is a general mistrust about how the images of the country are being used by both parties. One accusing the other of trying to sabotage the 10th of September. The other one trying, accusing the other of misusing the white and blue flag. The NIP have their own competition for national flag and national anthem. See the criteria? You have to give all of these explanations. The emblem shows that for any purpose of the choice of colors in a suitable explanation. The winner will receive a national flag plaque with a replica of the winning flag which also carries it a cash prize of $250. The results of that competition are published partially in this book called The People Sing, a collection of patriotic and other songs of British Honduras. In terms of this, this is the first queen of the bay. Maureen Hinson. Okay, thank you for that. In this competition, they received eight submissions 
for national anthem and about 80 submissions for flag, none of which we are able to find today. We'll be curious to see what those would be. Well, here are some of the songs that were submitted. Forever Free, We Lead Hunger Home, Home, and this space is, uh, is a protection over it, Land of the Gods, by Samuel Haynes. Did you see that earlier? In the Belief Billboard of Peace. So, this is one of the songs that was submitted. It tells you about the political dynamics in the segment at the time, in Belize at the time. Here are a few others. Here's another one, my native land. Land by the currency. You can see some of the names of persons here. Some famous people around there, actually. We fast forward now. Belize's independence is delayed because of the Guatemala claim. We all, we all know that. But there's an there's a initiative to lobby for wider support at the United Nations, and the, what is formed is the Belize Independent Secretariat. The persons who comprise them are still alive today. We have the privilege of looking at some of these files just prior to independence. Resolution 3520 says that Belize is to get its independence, and the things that must be decided on include the national symbols. So the Permanent Secretary of the Belize Independent Secretariat writes to the PS of the External Affairs and says, I am also attaching a description of the national bird, national flower, mahogany tree, and so on, and I also conduct a score of the words of the national anthem and of the gods. See this? 1981. At this meeting of Fort August 1981, Cabinet indicated its support for the symbols chosen by the committee. The report will be presented to the House of Representatives at the meeting of the 14th August 1981. In the case of the coat of arms now, the, uh, the appended presentation needs some refinements. The panel needs to be more realistic, and the mahogany tree at the top of the shield should conform to a real mahogany tree, as for the enclosed photograph. The coat of arms is surrounded by a circular wreath, as in the flag. And so the modifications are made, and watch what happens. Here is one of the first, one of the sketches. And, it's made. and you can see handwritten notes here. The individual's name here, believes this is Robert Leslie, Bobby Leslie. And you see here, only color change is insertion of four red flags in the schooner. For those of you who always like to who observe the flag, the little red flags on the uh, ship. And then there is a, it is to be embellished with a wreath containing 50 leaves. So for shot number one, and then you go here, and you see one of the pre-independent renditions of it. The competition itself, by the way, the backdrop to this is the competition, no? that in which Ines Sanchez and Evra Witt emerge as the, as the winners. So there's an initial ribbon here, it seems like. And that is replaced by, you can see that city staple there, placing the mahogany tree over. See, look at the men, by the way. Here's a more refined version. Notice the mahogany tree here sits atop, no? Here are the five original leaders. This is a painting done by Mr. Figueroa, German Figueroa Tinkayo. His, his uh, idea of what that first meeting of December 31st, 1949, was looked like in Mr. Price's house. So the Bolson, John Smith, Lee Richardson, possibly Apollo. He does this intentionally because we're still we, we still have to rely on oral tradition to see who would have been 
I'm sure they have records somewhere, but we haven't been able to find exactly where those are as to who I would have been inside this room. I understand it may have been as many as 12. And the dependence, this is the flag that is, how is it, replacing the Union Jack. So this is what we end up, it was produced in Liverpool in the, in the UK, and we end up with this particular flag. So this is the flag that was raised on September 21st at midnight. Captain Suchess, I think, was there. He has, I'm um, releasing a secret here, he has photographs from that period. I don't know of anyone else who does. So we have them secure, no? And this is for meaning, the purpose of meaning, let's look at this together. The flag was the very first flag hoisted over the independent country of Belize at midnight, September 20th, 1981. The ground of the government house in Belize was plunged into darkness, the Union Jack was lowered. When the spotlight flooded the flag pole, there flying proudly was the Belizean flag. Prime Minister George Price proclaimed, we dedicate this new flag of independence to the people and government of Belize, securing its sovereignty and owner of all its territory. As a pledge of national unity, the far blue and white Belizean flag, the flag of the revolution, has evolved into the blue, white, and red flag of the new independence of Belize. May this symbol of unity also be a pledge of our continuing determination to dedicate ourselves to the hard and productive work as we develop and organize our resources to sustain and serve the welfare of our people. Let the flag of an independent Belize be also a sign of all our to all our neighbors that we accept the responsibilities, the opportunities, and the rewards of freedom, and that we commit ourselves to preserve and promote the peace, stability, and prosperity in the region of the Caribbean and Central America. May this flag be a pledge of our recognition and our gratitude to all who have helped and worked with us to achieve this just, this just objective for which we daily pray to Her Majesty's government and the British people to our international friends and allies, to all and everyone. It is our flag. May we keep it, love it, and guard it. Long live Belize. So, contrast that with the origins. The imagery takes on different meanings as it moves through time. By the time we get to independence, it is a fact of unity. One of the questions that ask about the two men on the flag, a uh, Creole Belizean and a Mestizo Belizean is what is now described as the two men on the flag. Why that, they, that, why, why, why that emerged was that it was meant to reflect what was the situation of Belize at the time of independence. Here are the features of the Belize flag. The flag includes the coat of arms in its center, to this red border is one fifth the size of the length. It includes the high plant referred to as the square of the earth. The 50 leaves represent the year of the start of the movement. Features an Afro Belizean and a Mestizo Belizean. Red is referred to as ghouls and blue is azure. The pan and the axe appear twice on opposite sides. What are the main ideas then if we can look at this together to close? The coat of arms and design was likely influenced by the West India Regiment. The three people responsible for bringing this, because when you look at the minutes, they're all over that meeting. They are laying down the law in that meeting. One puts the motion, the other seconds it, one puts it, and, and so on. So they are asserting their position. By the time of the appearance of the Court of Arms, Selman was not in a colony, important to know. It was still, it was a vulnerable source of political structure due to efforts to end slavery in the region in England in that period. It was likely a symbol of the appeasement policy adopted by the aristocracy. It was also a part of the divide rule policy which, with respect to separating white scholars and blacks. That is the divide rule policy. Meaning is ascribed to the coat of arm. Meaning ascribed to the coat of arm has changed as the demographic has changed. Or as Belize became more culturally diverse. For example, in 1950 when the symbol is, it's become the symbol of resistance, but from that time in moving forward, we end up with race or ethnic consciousness again emerged during the 50s, 
Bring the nationalist movement over the question of closer association with a predominantly blackness in Israel, Latin America, Latin Central America. Political struggles emerge over the use and meaning as ascribed to the code of arms and flag. Some suggest that the flag does not reflect diversity or multiculturalism, that's a modern suggestion. And the flag and code of arms of independent beliefs together is an effort at addressing the issues of race relations and political partisanship. Hence, it unfurled at independence as the flag of unity. Because the committee that was formed at the time was a bipartisan committee, and they together agreed that this, because of its history as a symbol in the settlement, and it would indeed be an acceptable, acceptable representation of the country's history and a flag be flown for all the world to see. So thanks to Belize Archives and Records Service, NHL, National Religious Library, Museum of Belize, Celebrations Commission, the staff of ISCR, um, Giovanni Pinello in particular, Ronald Kokom, who scoured the archives, Maria Uche, Dr. Herman Bird, St. John'sKey.com, the Searles, who are here today, and uh, thanks to all who I may not have mentioned in this presentation.